she she had the she had the sense to start swearing at me. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> because she no, almost crashed no, no, no. me. Don't expect people who've made terrible mistakes on the road to take accountability for those mistakes. And there's lots to talk about. As always, it's been a very busy Friday morning, and it continues to be busy. We wrap it up with our favorite part of a Friday morning. That is where George Meany joins us. And George is here. He's looking uh, very fresh. George, you were up early this morning. Uh, people loved your comments on the show earlier. Uh, you see, even when you're not on the stream with us, you're still there and, uh, and still taking the lead. Well, uh, morning, Gareth. Morning, everyone else. But uh, uh, psychology and and language, uh, and the reason I was commenting was because they're very interesting things for me. Um, mm. uh, people don't realize that um, the you, you can you can tell who and what somebody is just by listening to the words. They don't have to right. say. Uh, the actual thing, but you can listen to the words and you can figure you can figure some stuff out that uh, that's in between those words. Couldn't agree more. So, George, uh, what are we going to be driving, flying, piloting um, this weekend? Have we got any plans for any of that stuff? Well, um, the Civil, Av Civil Aviation Authority has not returned my pilot's license for the Cheetah oh. yet. Um, it's been about three or four weeks. So, yeah. so that's a little bit frustrating. So I can't fly the Cheetah, but uh, um, my microlight is definitely on the cards. I went to fly it last week. Um, and uh, flying that microlight is still the best feeling ever. It's open cockpit. Um, and, yes. uh, you know, I might go do some of that this weekend. Um, awesome. But we have to answer a, a, a listener that um, uh, sent a question out or sent a question to to me via you last week mm -hmm. um and uh, and i thought i would i thought i'd address that in the beginning of this uh, of this little segment so right um she asked and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna reveal who she is because she hasn't given me the permission to do that but uh, but basically she's uh, driving a vw um is moving temporarily or permanently overseas <clears throat> and wants to know whether she should sell the car or whether she should keep it in storage or let right. somebody else drive it um, so I think that's what I've got kind of primarily out of the question. Um, yeah. So to, to, to answer the question, um, a car is a depreciating asset, whether it, uh, maybe if it's a classic, it's not, but it's a depreciating, a depreciating asset, whether you wrap it in plastic or whether you park it, or it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to depreciate. You're going to lose money over it in two to three years. Right. So that's the first consideration, I think, um, is it's, is it's a depreciating asset. Um, and the other consideration is, um, depending on the supply and demand of various makes and models, you don't know how much that particular VW is going to depreciate in the future. So you're taking a risk by keeping it, I think. Um, um, but cars do depreciate less if it's got less mileage on it. I mean, that's intuitive and it's, it's a fact. So mm -hmm. if you do park it, you're going to lose less money on it, but it's not going to, it's not going to save you any, any money um, around insurance, battery degradation, you'll probably have to replace that battery within the two to three year period that it's standing. And then service costs. If you want to keep its warranty, you've got to continue to service it. So you've got to have those service okay. costs. So you're probably paying more by keeping the car than uh, you would get by just selling it and, uh, um, and taking the money. Another thing that she says is that she's got a, um, an apartment that she wants to rent out. And whether mm. she should take the money from the car and put it into the apartment's bond. Absolutely. Because in my opinion, um, after tax debt, or should I say, no, unproductive debt that is paid with after tax money. It sounds like a long sentence, but yeah. um, uh, is the most, is the worst money you could ever spend. If you're paying interest on uh, uh, with using after tax money, you are effectively paying a double tax. So the best thing for her to do is to take the money Sell the car, take the money, put it into the, the bond of the apartment, rent the apartment out. There's a real asset. Um, and then come back in two and a half years, buy another car. And, and, um, and George, consideration. I mean, while, while you're giving, uh, this is really interesting stuff and this is good advice, but also I think it's valuable for people to realize that interest rates are likely to go up. And if you owe money anywhere and you can possibly kill that debt in any way you can by selling stuff you don't need, do it. Because you don't want to suddenly exactly. sit with interest rates that have gone up by 4 or 5%, which they're likely to do by all the economists' estimations. You don't want to be owing you know, an extra 5% on something, paying that back every month on interest. It's not good. 
that's really not good, um, especially yeah. personal debt that uh, that sure. is not a business debt or, or productive debt. Um, right. and, and then and then I think the final consideration is the used car market right now is very buoyant. If you sell your car now, you probably get more than you're going to get in about two years' time when the silicon chip shortage is sorted out and new cars are, uh, have got momentum again. So best time to sell that VW is right now. Okay. Great. Good. That's awesome advice. You see, you can send George a complicated email like this. He'll not only consider the, uh, the, the car side of this, but he'll also look at the economics of it. Very, very good advice all around. I like it. We're, we're being helpful and useful this morning. Very practical stuff. Practical stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. on a practical note, um, in uh, Calif California, San Francisco. So yes. uh, this happens everywhere. So let, let's bring it home. Um, I don't know if you've ever been into the center of Joburg. When last you've been into the center of Joburg. And uh, have you seen the hordes of pigeons that live in cities? Ugh, George, these pigeons. And they shit on everything. You should see the... the my car at the moment, well, Phil from DeWitt Motors' car, I, I have to have it cleaned today because th these things, they, you cannot believe the amount of bird shit that, that uh, has been dropped on my car in the last, just the last three days. I don't know where these pigeons are coming. And it's all pigeons, by the way. So you're saying in the CBD, it's become a real problem too. Well, in, in city centers, it's a problem where there are high-rise buildings. For some reason, pigeons gather there. And I think a pigeon is the dumbest bird on the planet. Um, oh, you know, they, they fly in the wrong direction if a car is coming. <laughs> They're just oh. stupid birds. They are stupid. <laughs> um, yeah. not, nonetheless, so what they've done in California, San Francisco, is they've hired a hawk. Um, this guy by the name of Harris. It's a five-year-old hawk. And the hawk's name is Pac-Man. And uh, <laughs> what the hawk does is he patrols with Harris along the streets of San, uh, of San Francisco, California, um, in these pigeon-infested areas. And the, mm -hmm. uh, the idea is not to encourage the hawk to, to hunt the pigeons or any rodents or rats, but, uh, uh, but apparently since the hawk has been patrolling the streets of California, um, the number of pigeons in the city center has halved. Yeah, well, they, they just see it flying around and they'll get out of there. It's a good they idea. Are petrified of pigeons. Talking about good. rodents, though, um, uh, there is a new New York City problem that's occurring, and I wonder whether it's occurring. Yeah, I don't think in South Africa it's as big a problem because we don't live in very condensed areas like Joburg City Center or Cape Town City yeah. Center. But uh, they've got a road, rodent problem that is a hangover from the lockdowns. So hmm. during 2020 and 2021, um, the rats would eat out of the dumpsters right. um, uh, in New York City because the food, the over, leftover food would be put into those dumpsters. And, uh, and so now the rats have resorted to, first of all, there's been this pr proliferation of rats. They've bred. So there's yeah. thousands more rats. But what they're doing now is because they can't find food, is they're climbing into the engine bays of cars and they're eating Ugh. the wiring harnesses of cars. Ugh. So they dug into this a little bit and uh, wondered why they're eating the wiring harnesses of cars. And the reason is, <clears throat> in, uh, by and large, because many, many manufacturers are now making wiring harnesses and the insulation around wire based uh, or made out of soya-based insulation. Soya-based oh, insulation. No. Oh, no. So this is a meal for the rats. It's a meal for the rat. So... <sighs> So, so now you're trying to save the environment, but you're creating this, this, <laughs> this um, bucket of food inside your engine bay. Well, this is and what Jonathan Witt, was just talking about. Jonathan Witt was just talking about this now, these unforeseen consequences of what seem like good decisions. And then they end up being terrible because their long-term costs and, and detriment are, are far greater than the immediate benefit, Right. Unintended consequence. I, you know, I agree with that. It's, it's, yeah. it's. You know, you can't predict everything out into the future. So, so now we start yeah. to look after the environment, soy-based wiring harnesses, etc. We have lockdown, and then suddenly cars are standing still because rats are eating the the soy-based harnesses. I mean, who could have said? Who could have known? Right. right. 
Um, and then very finally, um, I don't know if uh, uh, roundabouts is the right word. Roundabouts or circles irritate you. But do people really know how to drive through a roundabout? <laughs> and the right, reason so I bring this up is because someone this. almost crashed into me the other day. Oh, God. All right. So what is the rule? You, you give way to the right. Yes. So first rule is in entering the roundabout, you yield to the right. You give way to the right, as you put it. Yes. So, so if there's a car coming from your right, don't cut in front of them because that's not the rule. The rule is you give way to the right. The person in the circle has right of way. Um, the second rule is the two outer lanes. You have to exit the roundabout at the first mm -hmm. exit or at the latest, the second exit. You can't right. exit the roundabout at the third exit if you are in the outer lane. Yes. Exactly. Go into the inner lane if you're going to do more than two exits from where you're going in. Because, exactly. I mean, some of these circles, this, well, somebody, these circles can have, some of them can have four or five exits. It's not always four. It's not always three. It's, it can be many. But if you're on the yes. outside, they take the first or the second exit. Otherwise, you shouldn't be on the outside. And this is how somebody almost crashed into me is I was in the inner lane. Now, in the, uh, and I suppose the second exit is the problem here is because in the inner lane, you can exit the roundabout on the second exit onwards, right? Which yep. means that um, if a person is on the outer lane and I'm exiting the roundabout on the second exit and they continue going around, this is where I, somebody almost drove into, into the side of me. Um, right. um, and then I suppose the last consideration is um, heavy vehicles battle to go around roundabouts. So don't drive next to a truck in a roundabout. Oh. Rather just give them way. They battle to go around those things. Yeah, I saw, I saw a truck turning in, in you know, a fairly sort of congested area. Uh, yesterday and the car that was in the front obviously on the opposite side had to actually reverse and so did the car behind that one and the car behind that one because obviously these things have massive turning circles and you've got to kind of think not only for yourself but also for the truck driver otherwise you're going to end up in a situation where he's just going to you know pull your bumper or your bonnet or worse off of your car exactly Exactly. Right. So, uh, so that's it. That was my rant about traffic circles. That's good. Was crashing. And then, and well, then she she had the she had the sense to start swearing at me. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> because she yeah. almost crashed no, no, at no. me. Don't expect people who've made terrible mistakes on the road to take accountability for those mistakes. Dr. Robin says, "Oh my God, George, you're talking to my husband. He's obsessed with how badly people deal with roundabouts." See, this is important. This is so important. Absolutely. Tracy says, uh, "In Somerset West, we have a gazillion." mini traffic circles they work like rolling stop streets first at the circle first to proceed it's a nightmare there's a big difference between the two and sean says here in bulgaria people do not know how to use traffic circles either see george you've hit a nerve look at this in the exactly. uk you have thousands wow. of traffic circles terrible place to drive says sean yeah look what you've done george now you've got everybody all wound up on a friday morning <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> all right all right, that's uh, that's it for us for a Friday, and I hope you have an awesome weekend, and we will catch up again next week. A uh, big thank you to all of our guests this morning. George, great to see you, and we will catch you on Monday morning, bright and early at 6 o'clock for a full week. None of this nonsense of public holiday Tuesdays. See you on Monday. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye.